Okay, all, hopefully you all can hear me, see me. Yes, give me a five by nine if you can hear me, see me. I'm hoping everyone can. I got my light up well enough. Yes, 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 hear, see. <laughs> hear me, see me. <laughs> hopefully everyone can, I'm, I'm waiting. Um, everyone's here, I see lots of people. This is awesome. Good to see you all, guys. I hope uh, everybody's obviously been paying attention. We have a lot going on. Solar Cycle 25 is definitely ramping up. Oh, excellent. I see you guys are telling me you see me, hear me. Okay, excellent. Uh, my phone has not been leaving me alone, and I've gotten about three hours sleep. So if you see circles under my eyes, you can completely understand why. Uh, there has been so much stuff going on. We do have an incoming solar storm. It is on its way. As a matter of fact, it's a beautiful storm. And I'll even show it to you right here. Oh, I mean, this thing is backwards. Hold on. Let me reverse my view, my personal view, because there we go, because uh, I need to be able to see what you see. All right. I don't work well with, with mirrors. Selfie image thing just doesn't work for me. Okay. So if we take a look, I'll wait for this thing to reset. You got it right here. You'll see this is region 2939, and sorry about the eclipse. That's why things disappear for a little bit. But here's a gorgeous eruption. You'll see one down here, and you'll see one over here. Come on, come on, come on. You see these gorgeous? There's one. There's a little one, and whoosh. Isn't that beautiful? That was a beautiful filament eruption that occurred on the 6th. And because of the funky kind of way it came off, it's actually not a very fast solar storm. But this is the one that we're expecting to hit any moment now. I've noticed, and I'll show it to you in a second, that the Space Weather Prediction Center has revised their estimates of when this storm is going to hit. They did have it hitting late on the 9th. Now they've kind of pushed it back into the early, early hours of the 10th. We'll see. We'll see. These storms have a tendency to be fashionably late. Uh, you know, usually. And so that can cause us some issues where we just kind of like a hurry up and wait situation. It also is a little bit complicated because as you saw, there was a little bit of a filament eruption that occurred just ahead of it. And that when that lifts off and then the other one follows it, it creates this kind of one, two kind of thing going on in the coronagraphs. And I'll show that to you in a second. That also makes it difficult to, uh, to really calculate the speeds properly. So we've got a couple of things, a couple hindrances that make uh, calculation of this this particular sto solar storm and its arrival time makes it a little bit tough for us to predict. But uh, likely we're going to get hit sometime on the tenth, and it, there might be a decent amount of mass. So this one hit, might actually hit us with with a little bit of uh, of uh, staying power, which would be nice considering we've had kind of a few fizzles here and there. But uh, we have to admit, with especially with the Starlink thing, us space weather people are not only excited, but we're also frustrated because that Starlink mess um, really occurred. I don't want to say with with space weather people's pants down because they really weren't. But it sh but as we'll go into the briefing later, when, or w when I talk about how Starlink fell, uh, we'll go into that after I'm done with the forecast. But you'll see how tough space weather can get, and why it's so critical to have a scientist in the loop, no matter what you do when it comes to these types of, especially low earth orbiting spacecraft. Anyway, okay, so so that is the one thing that we're dealing with. Uh, I'll also show it on just on this before I go to a different color. We also have, uh, I think, believe it's region 2941 that is giving us some a little bit of a headache. It's an X flare, it's a barely an X flare player, but you can see it kind of fizzling and, and, and spurting like that. This thing we're watching, we've got about a 5% chance of X-class flares over the next couple of days. It is giving us about a 15% chance of M-class flares. So if you're an amateur radio operator and you're having noise on the bands, this is, this is the culprit right here. Believe it or not, region 2939, which is this one here, is actually rotating now to the west limb, and we're not getting all that much from it anymore. Um, but luckily, solar flux is still staying within, uh, you know, in, in the triple digits, and it's going to continue to be that way because we have even more regions on the sun's far side. Now, let me see if this is the one I want. No, I'm going to do that one in a second. Actually, yeah, I can. I can. Here's here's the a beautiful view of that same eruption, but and there's region 2939, but this is in the pink sun. So you're actually seeing a bit more of the footprint when this thing takes off because you can actually see the scope of it. And you see all the dimming regions. See, it wasn't all that much. It was mostly just that filament that erupted. But as you also see behind it, there is a little bit of a coronal hole. And I'll show this in a different color. This region is the one that gave us a G2 level solar storm about a month ago. If you guys remember back on the 17th of January, 
this guy's wrote, it looks like it's pretty much survived its far side passage. It may not be as well connected to the polar coronal hole, so it may not get us storming quite to the level that we saw before, but it still will bring us some storming. And you will see that in my five day outlook here in a minute. So let me switch. Here we go. Here's a, a better warm up for you. Let me start it over. So here's the bronze sun. This one also shows a lot of good activity with the region 2939. That was the that big filament eruption. You just don't see it in this wavelength. That's the big X flare player, which doesn't look quite as dazzling in this wavelength. Coronal holes, though, are what really stick out. So this is the deep boundary of that coronal hole. And you can see it's very well formed. So what this means is that when this region rotates to about over here somewhere in the Earth, what is the Earth strike zone for coronal holes, we're basically going to have that fast solar wind hit like kind of like a, a you know, like a brick wall. It's just going to turn on very, very quickly because we're going to go from a region of very slow solar wind to a region of very fast solar wind like that. OK, so that is going to create like a in, ahead of it, a really steep wave. And that's really what caused a lot of the storming last time. We actually were confused thinking that it might actually have been an eruptive storm, but it really wasn't. It was just this brick wall coming at us in the change between slow solar wind and fast solar wind. But the difference this time is that see this down here, this stuff right here, that is a polar coronal hole. It's always down here up here down in the South Pole. This polar coronal hole last time was really well connected. So it had a full, you know, uh, uh, you saw a, like a finger, a finger that extended all the way down and was really well connected. Here in this color, you don't really see it. You see it a little bit more in the in the purple sun, but yeah, it's better to look here to really tell how deep that finger might actually connect. And without that polar uh, extension, this, this this one is, that means that this hole is likely closing or migrating, and it probably doesn't have quite the power that it had last time. Last time, I think we got up to speeds with the fast solar wind. We got up to speeds of what? Over 600, maybe 700, maybe even higher uh, uh, kilometers a second. Not expecting quite as fast solar wind from this one this time. So again, could very well be a G1 solar storm player, but probably, but, you know, getting a chance of a G2, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if, if Noah's going to take it off the books or not. High latitude, sure, G2. But at low latitudes, mid latitudes, I don't know. We'll see. I, I definitely think it could be a, a G1 player. But this one isn't going to uh, be causing any issues for us for another probably five days once we get, you know, as you notice, right about today, it's sitting right about in here. It rotates to about here before things cut off uh, and restart. And that means we've got probably about four or five days before this one um, gives us some you know, some fun. But meanwhile, we still have that other solar storm to deal with. So let me switch to that for the moment so you can see what we're talking about here. Um, where do I want to go? Oh, I'll go to stereo in a second. Um, what are you? Oh, right. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't recognize it from its little tab here. So this is the, the chronographs, the chronograph image from, um, and I'll pull this larger and pull it down. This is the coronagraph image from Soho, Lasco. This is for an Earth-based coronagraph, an Earth orbiting, I mean, Earth in the orbiting. Um, it sits out in front of Earth. It's an Earth view coronagraph is the, what I was trying to say. And, and what you're looking at is essentially the raw images on this side. So these are what we call the intensity images. That's where you can barely see some wispy stuff coming out. And then on this side is the difference images. So what we do with the difference images is we basically, we subtract one, one frame from the other going forward. And what that allows it, what that actually does is it enhances features far better than we do in the raw images. So you can actually see, my goodness, I've got a lot of activity going on. I'm sorry. I better check to make sure nothing's going on. Nothing's wrong. My Vocals okay, yeah, because my VIPs, my VIPs have access to me. So, um, oh, I have a member of the Shrag contacting me, who wants to go live with me on on here. Yeah, sure, Mike, I could definitely do that. I've got Mike Cook, um, wanting to go live. Yeah, we'll we'll figure that out. Everybody, say hi to Mike Cook. Um, he's uh, he's a member of Johnson Space Center, and he is a one of the best for space weather forecasters for Johnson, uh, keeping the astronauts safe from radiation storms and a good friend of mine. Uh, so yes, Mike, I will, I promise. If you're watching, hello. <laughs> okay, so here is the, the difference image for the event that is on its way now. And as you can see, we've got down here in the south, I'm trying to look through my, my little rig here. 
down here in the south, when it, there you go, is when it launches, we lost a little data early on, but down here in the south is where that one filament erupted first. So we saw that little filament that kind of went achoo off to the east. <laughs> and then the bigger filament erupted center disk. And that is what this, oh, for goodness sake. Uh, that's what this um, whole big thing is here when you see this whole um, halo. Oh, I can't stop it that way. Let me try to stop. Right. Do, 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 do. There we go. I'll stop it here. So what you're seeing now, I'll just show you the, the raw images. See, nothing. <laughs> Hard to see, isn't it? Some of these storms, especially the ones that are that are erupt from the sun very slowly, they're really hard to see in the raw stuff. But once you get to the difference, peekaboo, suddenly you can see it. So this is what we call, in, in this case, it's, I don't know, people might argue with me either way. I would call this close to a full halo. It's, so it's probably a partial, but eh, really close to a full halo. Because really what we're dealing with is the sun being right here. We have this black occulting disk that blocks out the sun, the light from the sun. So we can see, you know, it's hairdo, right? We can see the solar wind. And then this ring, it goes all the way. And some of it goes down this way. And then some of it kind of goes, whoops, goes in like this and around. Actually, I could draw this for you if you'd like. I actually, I actually brought a pen with me. Let me see where I am. Oh, not too bad. So right around in here, right? And I go around. I love this technology. Isn't it wonderful? As I keep drawing, and then so that's one part that goes off that way. And then if I kind of continue, you can see more of it kind of going this way. And maybe it stops around-ish, ish, around in here. Yeah. Yeah right? Something like that. So is it a full halo? I don't know, because there's just uh, streamers and stuff in here. It's kind of hard to tell. But really what we're probably looking at is that, at least in the front part of this, the front part of this is that is that one that went uh, to the east of Earth. That's that, that little one. And then we've got this bigger one here. And this is partly why when you see revisions of, of these um, solar storm prediction models, that's what they're revising. They're clearing out things. They're trying different methodologies to to determine what is a better fit, what gives them a better, you know, what reduces the residuals. There's all these mathematical things that we do when we look at imagery that's like that's like this, and we try to make the best guess that guesses that we can uh, to get a timing for when this structure is going to hit Earth. Because what you're looking at is something that is coming straight toward the camera, and as it gets really big, it it literally eclipses the sun and becomes larger than the sun. So uh, that's what the, that's that's the signature it makes is like a halo, like an angel's halo over the the front of the sun. So we call them halo um, solar storms or halo CMEs. Anyway, so that is what that looks like. Um, and when I do the briefing on the, let me get rid of this. When I do the briefing on, whoops, hello, that was from a different class. Sorry, guys. Some people would see that and laugh. They'd know who, they, many of my students were in the class the other night. They'd go, ha, I remember that picture. Um, <laughs> So this is the so so this is the CME that we're waiting for the solar storm we're waiting for, and let me go to the models now so you can see. Is this going to be the model? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, I I am not showing NASA's version of the model at, at the moment just because I don't I don't have it up, but this is this is our prediction model. And low, I think I can make this a black screen if I click on it. Yes, it's probably easier on your eyes. Uh, so this is this is um, NOAA's version of the model. Uh, the top panel is density here. The bottom panel is velocity. And you are looking at the sun's north, you know, from the North Pole down on the North Pole, with Earth being off to the right. I'm sorry, I don't have my labels on today. I usually do, but this is Earth. So you can see that solar storm coming out right there. And as it travels, in this case, again, I probably have to pause it this way, right there. So we're having it hit essentially on the 10th now at 0200 hours. So those of you who remember a different version of NLOL that Swipsy had put out, yes, you are not fooling yourself. There was an earlier version that actually had it uh, coming out late on the 9th, 
but I think that's right about now. And so, you know, we're not seeing it. So Swipsy has done a, a revise the forecasters there. They're always trying to revise the forecast to make them better. And so we do have this structure that looks like it's going to be a dead, you know, a dead ringer for Earth, likely not going to miss us and actually not even going that far south, really kind of because this is a meridional cut now. So if you're looking down at the North Pole on this one, west is this direction, east is this direction. Here, this is a, a cut that go, that cuts slices right down the middle, if I can put my hand in the right place, right through here, north to south. This being north, this being south, and we're slicing right along the Earth's sun line. So you can see this thing looks like we're really going to hit the center of this thing. So let's hope. But if you take a look at the velocity panel, eh, it's not moving very fast. OK, so when we actually take a look at the time series, which I'll flip over here for a second, I've frozen it on the impact moment. We're not expecting. I mean, it's I don't know why they have it quite this intense, probably because it's a it's a dense structure. So they think it's going to be pretty dense. Careful. Don't believe these are much more qualitative than quantitative in, in many cases. I don't think it's going to be nearly quite this dense. Uh, but I think this they've got the speed about right. I do believe the speed will be pretty close to convecting. Uh, with the solar wind, which will be about 450 kilometers a second, maybe a little bit faster, but not by much. So expect a reasonably dense structure that'll hit, but it's not going to hit with too much oomph, simply because um, we're not expecting it to be that fast. But right around the 10th, uh, we could see aurora starting maybe even early, definitely at high latitudes, and it may drop down to mid latitudes pretty quickly. Okay, and again, I'll put that in the five day outlook. Um, just, oh yeah, so let me go back really quickly. Uh, yeah, 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 because I'll, I'll show that. Well, you know, let me show the solar flux first. I mean, not the solar flux, the x-ray flux. Let me show that first for you, and then we'll, we'll talk about it. So we've had a little bit of, if you take a look at the x-ray flux, I'm sorry, I've got move. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if you take a look at the x-ray flux, we've been sitting right about the B floor, a little bit above, I mean, excuse me, right below the C floor. Uh, which is showing that we're actually really kicking off. I mean, anytime you're at the seafloor, it means you, you likely have either a lot of active regions on the Earth-facing disk or you've got some M-flare players. And sure enough, we do. We've got region 2941, and it continues to pop off these little guys here and there. We are getting, again, back on the 6th, we did get this this small flare. This was from that. This was the, re the, the flare that actually was associated with the coronal mass ejection, the, the big solar storm that we're waiting to arrive now from region 2939. But there really wasn't a big flare associated with it, believe it or not. Um, meanwhile, we're just watching the region grow. And so 2949 or 41 is the one that we're paying attention to. That's the one that has a little bit of X flare potential. But the nice thing is that we're still staying reasonably, hovering reasonably around that seafloor. Solar flux mean, that means by proxy, Solar flux is sitting right around the triple digits. And if I go to stereo, now I will go to stereo. Because what I want is to show you, all right, it'll start over good. What I want to show you is, oh, slow down, slow down. Slow down there. Um, let me make it a little bit bigger. Come on, a little bit. There we go. I'll stand on this side. Okay. So you can see the date. Uh, this is that coronal hole that we're talking about. Whoops, let me get my stupid little mouse out of there. This is that coronal hole we're talking about. And you can see, it, see it's, there's a little bit of disconnection here. This is that polar finger. I'm, I'm trying to pay attention to see whether or not that thing really is connected. Well, if it is, we're going to get a little bit faster solar wind. If it's not, eh, it's not going to be quite as strong. But you can see there's a lot of activity going on in this region. Uh, we had a massive filament that was launched, whoosh, right there. Uh, that is not earth directed, but you can see um, we've actually had, there's actually a few other um, storms that have been launched over the past couple days. So we do have a bit of activity going on. Oops, let me shut this door. I don't know why it opened. Um, these regions are already on the earth facing disk and they're kind of waning, but we've got this big one up here. There's a couple active regions back here that look like they're gonna to continue to keep that solar flux boosted. A Little bit of activity as you can see. So I do believe even though solar flux will die down just a little bit, I don't think we're gonna drop down below triple digits, uh, at least easily not until this region rotates to the far side. And by then I do believe we're gonna see even more uh, bright regions rotating even from the north and possibly more from the south uh, going to be rotating into earth view. So amateur radio operators, 
And those of you who care about uh, solar flux being in triple digits for radio communications, you're, I think you're fine. I think you're all going to be in the green. The noise over the next uh, probably four or five days might be a little bit loud on the bands from region 2941, that big player there. But um, it's also the one that's keeping that solar flux boosted for you. So enjoy. Meanwhile, this thing, again, is going to cause an issue for Aurora photographers. Not an issue, but something that you'll enjoy. Um, but that's not going to be until the latter part of the week. Okay. Uh, let me stop this. And I think I will go to the five-day outlooks. That's what I... my. Yeah, I think everything else is going to be forensics. Yeah. Sorry, I'm looking at little tiny tabs and trying to make a sure. Okay. Um, here we go. So switching to solar storm conditions and aurora possibilities over the coming week. High latitudes, there's lots of red. That's good. That's good news for you all. Uh, we are expecting that solar storm to hit anytime. Could be momentarily. And at high latitudes, we are expecting major storm conditions. So uh, as a matter of fact, NOAA is giving us about a 75% chance of being at major storm pretty much all day. Uh, well, not all day, at least peaking. Um, and then in around the 11th, we begin to calm down just a little bit, but we still could see major storm conditions probably throughout the 12th. Things calm down as we move through the weekend, and then we pick back up again because we've got that potential for the fast solar wind from that coronal hole that I put part um, I pointed out to you. Now, this may be a little early. It's hard to tell whether we're going to get a nice Valentine's Day kiss uh, from the sun, but we might. Okay, so I just put that there. As you can see, we could go from active to major storm conditions. It's hard to know when that brick wall is going to hit us, and that's going to be like a, um, you know, a big, a big kind of what we call the stream interaction region in front of that fast solar wind. It always arrives faster than the solar wind does ahead of the solar wind. Um, because it's the fast solar wind pushing that slow solar wind out of the way. At mid-latitudes, we really are only expecting active conditions, but considering how much storming we've had recently, right over this last week or two, uh, we, these active conditions, we, we are kind of preconditioned to storm. The Earth's magnetic field is a little bit on the rattled side. So I, I wouldn't be surprised if we bumped up to minor storm conditions from this, this even this, you know, small, G, what could be a G1 level solar storm. Uh, it Storming should easily last in through the 11th before things calm down. So I'm thinking active conditions both days. Um, but we still could see a little bit of activity through the 12th and the 13th. Again, things should quiet down through the weekend and then pick up a little bit again. Really um, wide range of possibilities here on the 14th, simply again because I don't know when that big brick wall of fast solar wind is going to be reaching us. So we could be anything from unsettled to minor storm conditions. Uh, just be aware of that. So Aurora photographers get to go, yay, this is a great time for us. Switching to our solar flare and particle radiation storm outlook over the coming week. We are still dealing with that region 2941. That's this player right here. And we're going to be dealing with it likely all the way across the rest of this week. So we are sitting at about 15% chance uh, of M-class flares. Noah's giving that over the next three days. And we have about a 5% chance of X-class flares from this region. Yeah, I don't know if it's really going to give us that, but you know, it's we always got to pay attention when when you see that. So it, it's it's an M flare player that wants to be. When it grows up, it wants to be an X flare player. We'll see if it gets there. Meanwhile, we're sitting at uh, solar flux around 120. I'm not sure what the revised numbers have been today. Uh, if we're already kind of on the downswing, um, but we'll probably drop into the into the 110s maybe a little bit lower than this, but I don't think we're going to break below triple digits just because of, we've seen what's on stereo, on the, the far side of the sun from stereo's view. And then also, um, again, we are still sitting at the D2 minor range. We are just skirting the edge of it. I'm almost back to go to, about to go to the D1 normal range because cosmic ray flux is really getting pretty, it's, it's dropping all the time. Uh, solar cycle 25 is finally kicking off and that sun is really beginning to shield us again and shield us out of the cosmic ray area. So you frequent flyers and this does include air crew who fly over <laughs> who fly over uh, 800 hours annually and fly at high latitudes and high altitudes. Uh, you are barely in the in the moderate range for radiation dose. So still keep monitoring your radiation dose over these next few uh, weeks or possibly months before things finally kick down to the D1 minor range, but we are getting there. And that is pretty much it for uh, the space weather briefing for the coming solar storm. So if you have you know, questions, I'll take a couple questions and then I'll go into the Starlink briefing. 
that is going to be a bit more relaxed and um, and more in depth. It'll give you some interesting stuff that you probably won't find anywhere else because I'll talk about how this was a cons I think honestly, and and this is just me. I'm not speaking for my community. None of that. Okay, this is just me. Um, so please don't. If I'm wrong, or if a if a colleague is watching and you disagree with me. Pelt me with olives, feel free to pelt me with olives, but don't think I'm speaking for you because I'm not. This is just my speculation. And I'd really love to have um, dialogue on this for, from, from my, my you know, PhD colleagues, the uh, ionospheric physicists, as well as the magnetospheric physicists, because it's, um, this is a really neat event. I hate to say that. It's like a very costly, neat event. Um, and I don't know how often we'll see it, but I do think that Starlink could be set up for a failure like this again, if the, if the conditions conspire like they did this time. And we'll talk about that more in a second. So let me ask you a couple questions. My goodness, lots of people are, um, lots of people are trying to get a hold of me. Wahoo. Okay. So what kind of questions do we have guys? And, and obviously if you're a Patreon, um, part of my Patreon family, I, I look for your names. So. Um, let me know if you've got it, uh, if there's any questions at all, any possible X flares in this maximum cycle. Yes, we've got lots of them. Deep quake. Wow. That's going to be Matt Matthew Shipley. Can you going to, uh, talk to him about that? You got to talk to, um, um, oh my goodness. What is his name? I'm, I'm, I'm running on three hours of sleep. So please forgive me. Who is the crazy, great, fantastic guy who is linking all of the um, earthquake stuff together. Not, not suspicious observers. No, no, no. I forget his name. I will think of it shortly, but my mind is on Starlink, so I, I can't switch gears. If somebody reminds me, Dutch sense. Thank you. Dutch sense. That's who it is. My mind came back to me. <laughs> he's very, he's, you know, he's uh, got some, some things to say about the USGS, which I, I don't agree with, but um, I, I like I like the French science that he does. He really tries to make things um, work. Please keep your questions limited to today's topic. Yes, thank you, Jerry. I appreciate it. And yes, be nice to Jerry and Mike. Uh, Jerry Ryan and Mike Richardson. They are the moderators. They are also um, my VIPs in my Patreon community. So they are they are the superstars in my family. And I see Lisa. Oh, Lisa, you said superstar Tamitha. That's so kind of you. You're so kind. Um, Oh, good. Matthew Shipley's up here. That's excellent. Chris is on. Hi, Chris. Good to see you. Uh, ask, ask away if you've got, got, if you've got questions on the forecast. If you don't have questions on the forecast, then we will move into the deep dive on why Starlink fell. Yes, Dutch sense. That's right. Dutch. If I say his name wrong, I'm, I apologize. I apologize. Um, Dutch. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Um, so... Yes. Hi, Mike Cook. Did you see the C impact? Liz, it looks it looks weak. Is Vincent? Did the CME hit? I looked just recently. I hadn't seen it, but I've been prepping this. So have we? Do we have an arrival? Well, that's good news because that means if the CME has arrived, if the solar storm has indeed arrived, that means it's not slow compared to what we've been expecting, uh, which gives better aurora chances. Even if it looks weak, if it's not driving a, a shock wave, and we're not expecting it to have driven a shock wave. Just because it's weak now doesn't necessarily mean it will be weak throughout the entire thing. But, you know, I, again, when you've seen one solar storm, you've seen one solar storm. You can't, you can't make predictions. Um, every, every single one of these things is a, is a unique uh, entity and needs to be an, an analyzed, you know, on the spot. Hi, Tamitha, three hours sleep. Welcome to my world. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Great stuff for Starlink. Yes. It, you, like I said, you'll get some insight in here that, uh, that only my students have gotten thus far. How come SpaceX got caught, cut out by a CME? Couldn't, couldn't they planned around it? Um, that's, that's part of the problem with this. Uh, I'm sure they did plan around it. The problem is the CME didn't, the CME arrived and then a second one arrived and then a third one arrived. And they were all in, in our observations, they were all kind of crushed together. So we didn't, we had a hard time seeing the ones that were kind of hiding behind. It was actually like a, a little train of, of, of solar storms all together. And we just didn't know. So when the first one arrived, everybody went, oh, good, it's here. It's gone. Let's take a look at the conditions. No, the conditions are good. Let's fly. And then whammo. I mean, it, 
Well, and you'll see that in just a second. It was almost like the sun played a trick on everyone. Um, and remember, what makes a solar storm strong is not the part you can see. It's the part you can't see, okay? What makes a solar storm strong more often than not are not the particles in the solar storm, but its magnetic field. Magnetic field is invisible, and, and this is what we'll get into. Um, so things get very interesting very quickly. Okay, Swipsy saying sudden impulse at 441. Okay, well, we got a compression. That means that likely the solar storm hit. So that's good, guys. So who knows? We might get back to, um, you know, hear this stuff pretty soon. So let's, let's hope. Aurora photographers may need to pack it up. So yes, I am going to dive into the Starlink stuff now. So if you were only here for the solar storm briefing, feel free to leave. I will not take offense. <laughs> And happy hunting. <laughs> okay, so um, so what I'll do now, let me, because I haven't seen a lot of, I've seen a lot of people talking about this thing, but not a lot of questions. Um, yes, look at this. So you think he's scratching his head right now? <laughs> I don't know. Um, you know, he's got a lot of consultants, so I'm sure, I'm sure he's got, you know, scientists in the loop that are, that are taking a look at it. I will be very interested to see if they have anything close to what I'm going to talk about. And they might, they might, they might not. So the reason why I pulled this up, I mean, it was just very easy. I just did a Google search. The reason why I pulled this up is because I want everyone to get as many views of the actual Starlink satellites themselves. Because those of you who do not recognize them, these things are, <laughs> they are tiny, tiny, tiny little army men, so to speak, or army people attached to a very, very, very long parachute. <laughs> this is the thing that if you follow me on Twitter that I talk about all the time, that the there's a lot of unique, a lot of first things, first moments, first um, you know, unique aspects of Starlink that, that are making them an, an exciting, um, in a sense, laboratory of, of satellites for space weather physicists and ionospheric physicists to, uh, to, to learn more about our own environment. And the reason why I say that is because not only is there this massive constellation of them, uh, but it's a massive constellation of small sats, right? These guys are tiny, right? Anybody, I mean, I'm not going to go into the details of them because I'd probably get the facts wrong because I've learned them and then forgotten them. I mean, this is tertiary to my, to my actual, you know, job in that sense. But these are small sats. And so, you know, that's one of the reasons why the solar panel looks so massive. When you have a massive satellite, solar panels the same size would look pretty small. But these things, you know, they, they, they do need a bit of power. And, and so what I call these, sadly, are albatross wings. And the reason why they're, they're the albatross of the spacecraft, if anyone knows the rhyme of the ancient mariner, is it really is uh, fitting because these, these act as huge drag parachutes. And if anyone has ever played with one of those plastic little army guys when you were a kid, I was telling a reporter that earlier today. Um, if you if you play with one of those little army guys that have the big parachutes, right? And these things are so light. You throw them up in the air, you wind them, you throw them up in the air and they just, and it takes them almost forever to come down. Well, the reason is because they're really, there's not enough inertia. There's not much going on with these things. So the air really can affect how they move. And that's really what we're dealing with is this tiny little army person, plastic army person on this very large parachute. And I'm sure he doesn't like my description at all, but it's a, it's a whimsical way of talking about really in, in an intuitive way of talking about how these things can get blown around a bit when the atmosphere decides to, you know, puff out and do something that it wants to do. So it's really a recipe for drag. You know, if you want to maximize your drag, build something like this. Sadly, if you're going to do that, well, launching it in LEO might not be the smartest thing to do, especially during the rise of Solar Cycle 25. So we'll talk about that in a bit. All right. Um, so where do I want to start? Well, if I go, if I go to, so I'm going to go to Twitter for a second. And the reason why is because I think I have to find, um, Mark, did you put this? I forget who put this on here. Where is the actual the actual press release? I forgot. I, ha I actually had it up as a press release. Um, is, if anyone has not seen the press release, I might as well I might as well open up the press release. I'll just say SpaceX press release on Starlink, right? And yes, I told you this was going to be casual. So um, 
Is this the one I'm looking for? No. No, how in the world did I not get the one I need? Oh my goodness. Um, let me minimize this thing so I can get to it. This is what happens when you... There we go. No, that's space.com. I wanted the one from actual um, SpaceX. Gosh, there's so many. Look at all these reporting things on it now. Holy merd. You'd think that people don't have anything else to do but report on Starlink. Wow. Update SpaceX. Okay, is this the one? Yes, thank you. Good night. It was hard to find that. Wow. Yeah, I think that there's nothing else to do in space but talk about Starlink. Okay, so if you haven't seen this, it's probably hard to find now, but this is actually SpaceX's own press release. Okay, um, and you can see, yeah, SpaceX. So what they were talking about in this very, very, you know, basic press release is that 49 of their, of their satellites that they launched, 49 of them went up and it looks like 40 of them are going to come down. Uh, I think a couple of them already have. Now, what they talk about immediately, and I guess I can push this up here for those of you who are not totally familiar with it, 210 kilometers was the perigee. Now, for those of you who know it, aren't familiar with perigee and apogee, it's a, it's a very jargon-filled way of talking about an orbit where you actually have part of it. It isn't just a circle uh, going around something. It's actually kind of an oval. And you, if you have part of it tilted, like so, if the part that you're gonna, you're going to, if you're going to orbit Earth, if you have that oval offset, so that you actually come, what part of that oval comes closer, or that ellipse comes closer to the planet on one part of it than further away on the other, then the closest approach is called perigee, and the furthest away you go is called apogee. So closest point, furthest point. Okay. So we're talking about the perigee, which is the closest point, which makes sense because if we're going to talk about these things falling out of the sky, you don't care how far away they get. You only care about how close they get to the ground, right? So they have a perigee of 210 kilometers, which is low. This is sounding rocket area. This is, I was actually quite surprised to see this. I've had it on, on multiple authorities that really you can't fly, like orbit, actually successfully orbit something. Um, unless it's sitting around, you know, 350, maybe even 400 kilometers before it's degrading so rapidly that it's it's not a stable orbit at all. So to see this was actually quite shocking, um, to, to be honest, at first. But then I thought, okay, well, solar cycle 25 has been asleep for so long. Solar flux has been low for so long that our atmosphere has been relatively cool, okay, been actually pretty cold. And when things get cold, yeah, they shrink right? Or in general. Well, as solar flux increases, the atmosphere begins to get warmer, right? You've got more solar, more heat, more, you know, total solar radiance on the, on the atmosphere. And it, on the day side, it's going to heat the atmosphere. And then on the night side, as this, that part of the atmosphere rotates to the sun's far, or to the earth's far, or night side, <laughs> sorry, I'm so used to talking about the sun, the Earth's night side, it's going to cool down, but it's not going to cool down all that much. There's lots of global convection patterns that occur, and we'll talk about some of those in a minute. And those global convection patterns keep the atmosphere warmer than it would have been if everything stayed cool. So then as that the night side rotates back to the day side, well, it's a little bit warmer than it was before. And then it gets warmer still as it rotates through the day side again, and then it cools down, but not quite as much. And as you can see, this begins to spin up quite quickly in terms of temperature. Right. And so when we talk about um, solar flux, I might as well just pull this up for the moment. Um, a gentleman who is extremely well, well versed, Jonathan McDowell, uh, he's done such a great job um, with all this Starlink stuff. Do I want to have this here or do I want to go back to mine? Hold on. Let me go back to my page because I've got it right here at the top. At least I thought I did. Hello, where are you? No, 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 I'll talk about that yet. Where is it? There we go. So this is what I wanted. Whoa, big. Okay, so Jonathan put up this plot. So I, I'll show you the tweet in a sec because I, I want to make sure he, he gets his kudos. Jonathan is just, he's, he's a fantastic guy. If you don't, if you're interested in Starlink and you don't follow his page, you really need to follow his page um, because he, he pays attention. He takes all this data. These are all the Starlink satellites um, at least from, from, you know, that have been launched that are in, in operation. And he talks about uh, perigee being in blue, apogee being in red. Remember, we just talked about that. 
blue in this case being perigee being as closest approach, apogee being as far away from Earth as it gets. Here's the, the height going up along the axis and then time, right? So you see 2021, 20, 22. Guy's been amazing. I mean, he's followed all of this stuff, even the ones that get decommissioned, even the ones that fall. He tracks all why they fail, what's happened, what all the records are. Just very meticulous work and and probably a thankless job to be to be um, totally honest. But he's done some he's run some models of the density and I forget in this tweet he talks about like if this is 200, 210 or 220 kilometers, there's multiple multiple um, uh, heights that he's run the the emsis model. This is a model that basically talks about how the atmosphere is responding and it has certain types of inputs and one of the major inputs is the F10.7 flux because it's a proxy for the solar heating. And as you can see, this has been solar minimum. This is why we've been complacent for so long. And this is why I've been telling my students for years, this is lulling us into a sense of complacency. This is not what we're gonna be dealing with because this was a deep solar minimum. And all during this time is when Starlink came online, right? Starlink has never known anything other than this, a really quiet solar flux that's in between really about 60, anywhere between 60 and 80. I mean, really low, okay? But as you saw, we had a little blip back in late of November, but it didn't last of, of, tw of 2020. And then it went back to solar minimum again. The sun went to sleep. It's kind of like, you know, it's like Groundhog Day, right? The sun woke up and saw a shadow and went back. The sun sh saw its shadow. That's kind of cool. I don't even remember that. So the sun saw a shadow, um, its shadow back in November of 2021. I went back to sleep and uh, stayed quiet for reasonably quiescent until about mid 2021. And then we started seeing signs of life again, right? Came back out of its hole, this time didn't see its shadow and decided it would wake up. So we've been kind of stumble bumping along with, with fizzles and, 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 you know, kind of false starts, as you can see, one, two, three, four, Scott McIntosh has gotten very upset with the sun, especially back here, because the sun just refused to really just kick on. But finally, it looks like as of this month, if you look at Scott McIntosh and the NCAR group's work, that looks like the sun, we finally have gone through the Terminator. And now, whoosh, <laughs> you can see that solar flux just pumping up and it's going to continue to pump up. OK, so that is what happens when you pass the Terminator. You can really start seeing it um, lighting up. And of course, at the EMSIS model is showing a slow but obvious rise in the density at certain um, altitudes, okay? The higher you go up, and I do, I do remember this, like I said, I think this is two, 200, 210, 220, or 200, 220, two, I, I, or something like that. I'll pull this tweet up and we'll, we'll correct it in a sec. Um, but as you can see, you get a little bit of a density increase at the lower altitudes, but with the higher altitudes you go, you get you get a big, much bigger change. Okay, not much bigger, but bigger, a bit more of a steep slope. Um, the density is, and if and one of the things that should be looked at really that isn't in, in this plot is really the gradient of the density, how it's changing, because the gradient of the density oftentimes has a lot to do with it. Um, but but here's the or and, and is an interesting parameter to look at. But here is the interesting thing too. This only goes by this, this, these aren't solar storms. This is just sun's output brightness, okay? So yeah, solar flares are in there. More likely what's in there, more than solar flares, which are too transient and too small, are the bright regions and all the bright parts, the radio flux that comes with having angry bright regions on your face. <laughs> like how angry can a kid be with acne all over them, right? So that's kind of what we're dealing with is really the, the radio flux, the bright, the, the radio brightness. But that is an in, that is an indicator, a proxy in this case. It's a proxy for um, how fast and how strongly the atmosphere is being heated. But again, quiet, no solar storms in this. OK, so when people look at this, they go, yeah, yeah, OK, I get it. I, I, maybe there's something to it. But we see changes of 50 percent often. And if you go back to the reason why I say 50% is because he says it right here. So there's been a lot of chatter with a lot of space weather physicists. And I'm not saying anybody's wrong. Or, you know, I hope you guys can read this. Is it, is it high enough quality? Let me make it a little bit bigger. 
um, this is going to be something that's going to be talked about for a while. So if, if anyone, if anyone's a, a, a physicist who is not liking the way I'm presenting what I'm saying, you know, I, I don't present, I don't say that I know what's going on here, but 50% higher than during previous launches for the, for the atmospheric drag to increase. That's not surprising to a lot of space weather physicists, a lot of ionospheric physicists who look at MSIS all the time and look at the model changes. Not surprising. Okay. So that in of itself was not enough of a, uh, you know, it was not enough to cause people to really kind of think, why can't Starlink handle this? Um, so I don't know if that's the whole story. And I'm not sure anyone else is convinced that that's the whole story either. Uh, although perhaps some of these physicists who have studied space weather for so long are much more, uh, you know, um, this number is not something that surprises them because we see it in our studies. It's just that maybe the, the Musk team has not. I mean, maybe it's more surprising to them because if I can get back to my picture, scientists look at this data all the time. Maybe the engineers who launched the spacecraft didn't. I don't know. Um, those, those are questions that are, that are best left to the reader. Exercises for the reader. How's that? But again, this stuff, remember, this is, not, this is not actual data. This was not measured. This is a model. So I don't want to see anybody running off to the hills saying, look at the data, look at the data. This isn't data. Okay, this was not observed. This was not measured. This is a model that does the best job it can with the inputs it's got and the physics that's involved. Okay, so realize these are model outputs. So we don't truly know, unless we go to spacecraft, we don't truly know what the densities are. And densities oftentimes don't always correspond. The real life densities are oftentimes a lot more variable and they don't always correspond um, with, uh, with what model outputs are. And I'm not going to say anything more about that because that is a slippery slope. If I talk about that, I could get myself in trouble big time real fast. So here's the tweet, guys. Just to make sure Jonathan gets his cred, really cool guy. Go visit his website. Go check him out on Twitter, Planet4589, if you need to, if you don't already. Um, but yeah, so when he's talking about the atmospheric density, that's this panel that we just went over. At 200, which is, oh, I'm sorry, my fault. 200, I did it backwards, didn't I? 200, 250, and wait, 220 and 250. Okay, so 200, 220, 250. Oh, I should have figured that out. Of course, density goes down as you go up. What am I doing? This is, this is me with three hours of sleep. So anytime you see this, if I said that this was higher, I'm just thinking because it goes higher. Silly me. See, sometimes when you're tired, you make silly mistakes. This is actually, this is actually the lower altitude stuff. Of course it is. It's the higher density stuff. Altitude gets less dense as you go up. So as you go higher in altitude, the density goes down. Silly. But in all three, you can see you definitely have a rise up. But I don't honestly think the answer is here because this is quiet. This is quiet time. It's only looking at solar flux here. It's not taking um, nearly the, the um, now I know we have, I know there's other inputs for, for MSIS, but we'll get to that. We'll get to why, because it uses indices. We'll get to why I believe the KP index was also fooled. All right, let's see. Um, do I want to go there yet? Okay, so yeah, we're going to get to the solar wind data in a second. So Jonathan started asking questions, and good old Space Weather Mike, who hopefully you're still watching, this is my friend who is, works at the Shrag um, and was asking to, to next time be on live. Absolutely, Mike, that'd be fantastic. I'd love to have you on the phone. I wish you could come to the studio, but you know, it is what it is. But we'll figure that out. Um, we were asking, Jonathan was asking about what's going on with the solar wind. Why would just a, a you know, what, what was the what was the geomagnetic conditions at the time? Why would it be such a big deal? Well, the issue here is that if you notice February 2nd, February 3rd, February 4th, February 5th, we even go further out. Uh, there was a lot of geomagnetic activity and the solar storm, I believe, was forecasted. Was it forecasted to hit on the third or hit on the fourth? I forget. But if you notice, there wasn't a lot going on. Right. And there wasn't a lot going on in here. And we'll talk about why that is in a second. As a matter of fact, for those of you who are scientists and really care about DST and hate indices, huh, 
we're not talking about very much. Erica put up, posted that DST looks like what, maybe minus 75. This is the real time DST. You see it's a double dip. So that means that, you know, that the depression, anything less than zero is, is some level of storming. Um, and, and a geomagnetic storm at that, not substorms. Okay, so those of you who know AE index, uh, uh this is different. This is ring current stuff, not a rural electrojet. These are bigger storms. Okay, this stuff drives longer. But a seven, minus 75 is it's a storm, but it's not you know super intense. Um, what you can see though, it did take a long time to recover, and it, there was some level of storming that existed for some time, which made me kind of think, okay, well maybe that's part of the problem. Is that it, you know, just like when you heat up the atmosphere slowly, right? You heat it up a little bit at a time incrementally, it continues to add, right? Little tiny increments add up in the aggregate you know, over time and it becomes more about climatology than it does weather. So you can't look at a particular incident per se. But then I, I said, okay, that may have set the stage. But let's take a look at the solar wind. Oops, I probably shouldn't have done that. Let me scoot this over for a sec, just in case I need to come back to it. Okay, so I think I've set you up for the solar wind stuff. Uh, I don't want the map, I want this. Okay, load. This is the problem. I did take a screenshot of it in case it doesn't load, because I don't want to be standing in front of a blue screen forever. It's like the blue screen of death. Anybody who ever remembers the old PC? Um, maybe I can, I don't want to reload. I, I zoomed it in <laughs> and, 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 ah, it came back. Yay. Okay, good. So here's the solar wind. And yes, it looks like Walt Disney threw up on it, right? All over it. It's very colorful. That's a friend of mine used to say that when he'd see plots like this, he goes, oh gosh, what are you doing? All right. I think it's, I, I like it, but um, all right. So what we're going to look at, it's very complicated, but for those who can read really, really small writing. <laughs> this says, my goodness, what does this say? This is January 13th, 16th, 19th, 22nd. Okay. 22nd here, 28th. Wait, is this right? No, it doesn't. It isn't my fault. Why is that? That's weird. What is that down there? Why is that saying that? I don't know. It's a, don't look at the very bottom. I'm looking at that going, those dates are wrong. This is better. I'll, I'll cut it off so you can't see that. Good night. That was confusing. That's better. February 2nd. <laughs> I'm thinking this wasn't a storm that was happening in January. February 3rd. Okay. Feb 4th, Feb 5th, Feb 6th. Sorry if you can't read it. That's one. If I have a major complaint about Space Weather Prediction Center's real-time solar, solar wind reader is that, my goodness, it keeps the print small no matter how much you zoom in. Okay, top panel is magnetic field. Middle panel is also magnetic field, but it's the orientation of the magnetic field. These, these panels say the same things in different ways. This panel is density, if you can't read the numbers. This panel is speed. Trust me, I will go over them all with you. This panel's temperature, we're probably not going to be talking much about temperature, but we will be talking about the KP index, and it's a stoplight chart. Right? It's the same stuff that if you watch my solar storm forecast, it's the same stuff you've always seen. Green means good. Yellow means eh, active conditions. Red means storm. Okay, So you see two sets of storm conditions Right, where KP in, in, the KP index ended up being five. So what we're going to look at is that right here, and I probably could pull out my, uh, in just a minute, I'll probably pull out my, my little drawing tablet again. Right here is where we were anticipating that first storm to hit. We were expecting it to hit late on the, well, pretty much on the second, I believe. It, was, it ended up being, if I recall from the forecast, it ended up being almost on time, maybe a little bit early, okay? So this was the storm that we expected and we got it. And so of course, Musk is like, well, and crew and everyone else for that matter is probably going, well, we got the green light to launch, right? We're gonna launch on February 3rd. We got the green light. We, the storm's hit. It's pretty weak. It's not doing much. It got us to active conditions for a few moments. And for those who know, the storm is mostly northward pointing. Now, why do I say that? Well, if you take a look at the red, okay, the, 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 the white line is the total magnetic field. Okay, so if you're looking at a storm, if you're looking at, a, at, the, at the strength, the magnetic field strength of a big solar storm. 
the total strength is this white line. Okay, so that's as strong as it gets. The red line in this case is just one component of the magnetic field. Okay, and it basically you can tell a bit about the orientation from this. What I care about is what we call the southward component. Okay, so this is when the field turns south. South means less than zero. So anything below this, this line, this horizontal line, that is basically where zero is. Anything below it is southward. Anything above it is northward. Okay. So when the storm hit, it went southward for just a moment, briefly. But very, very quickly, it's basically at the beginning of the second, went northward. And it went northward pretty strongly. This is about 10 nanotesla. That's decent. That's not small. Okay. It stayed northward, kind of dipped down just a, a little bit, got weak, but still stayed northward for a very long time. As a matter of fact, it stayed northward for more than half a day before it dipped southward for just a moment. And this is going to become important for, in a second. And then it jumped back northward again. Okay. So for basically outside of this tiny little zip, this thing was in completely northward and in mo many cases, strongly northward for almost a day. Okay. So what does that do? Has anyone has ever seen my solar, my um, mini courses, especially the last two, the ones I just finished teaching, you guys might have an inkling of what it, what happens. <laughs> for those of you who say, oh, I don't ever want to see those Comet MedEd modules again, ever. They're back. <laughs> those of you who have never had a Comet MedEd class, they are very good um, for what they are. Uh, very intuitive cartoon-ish videos that you can look through. And we are going to use them again simply because I think they have a lot, they help immensely with what we're about to talk about. And they help immensely because, you know, they're immersed back into, for those of you in my Patreon community, you guys are used to these, right? You kind of, it'll, it'll help you feel familiar. So if you recall, when we talked about solar wind coming into the earth. So for those of you who don't know what this is, this is the earth. The sun is over here and it's throwing bleh, a solar wind at you, right? And the solar wind has magnetic field. And you'll see in this module, the magnetic field comes down, you know, it's showing southward magnetic field. I think that's what we're, this one's showing. Yes, it is. And I know that because of what I looked at over here. Okay. When southward magnetic field hits the earth, the front of the earth's magnetic system, this lit up neon blue line is actually a magnetic field line. And believe it or not, it's actually closed. So if I show this, I probably should have shown it before it got to here. Now I'm not gonna give a huge briefing on, on the, the tutorial aspects of this, because if I do, my gosh, we'll be here forever. But here's that southward magnetic field in the, in, in the solar wind. And here is part of the Earth's magnetic system, okay? And for those of you who don't know what the Earth's mag the core of the Earth's magnetic system looks like, just grab a slinky. It's really simple. Take the slinky, wrap it in a circle. Pretend Earth sits in the middle of this donut. Okay. Take that donut, turn it sideways, and paste it right here. Okay. I'm gonna take it away, and that outline that you see right here, this outline, boop, that's the outline. Okay. So Earth's magnetic field sits, Earth sits in the middle of this donut, the heart of the magnetic shield, or what we call the magnetosphere. And if it doesn't, thing doesn't flop, you can see a line. I could draw a line from here to here, All right? And that's what you're drawing, here to here, okay? Now, again, if you want more detail, go to my mini course that I just gave. I mean, it's literally still up on my, on my main feed. It's like the last video I did. Um, but this magnetic field has a field that goes northward here. Solar wind, if I can get my hand out of the way, has a field that goes southward, okay? When these two meet, in this case, that's the magnet. You have a magnet, little magnet from the sun, or rather a big magnet from the sun, and you have the Earth's magnetic field as a magnet. When magnets of op opposite polarities uh, touch each other, they click and they become one system. If you don't believe me, go grab a, fridge, a couple fridge magnets and try it. When you have the poles oppositely aligned, they will click and become one system. How they do that is through breaking. They annihilate each other right here and they connect. So this thing will go down and it will connect to this and connect into here. But it will have broken itself. It will have broken to do that. 
And then this side connects to the side that got left out. <laughs> so nobody's left out. And then it draws itself out this way. So you can watch this. And I'm not going to do too much of this. But you can watch it. Boop. See that? Okay. Now, why did this come up? Well, if you were in my class last time, you know the reason why is because when that solar wind, when the field is southward, this is south. And I'll just keep this drawn. Should I do it in blue? No, I'll do it in Go down this. I'll keep it in red. Yeah. So if I draw probably oops. <laughs> probably over here. Yeah. This is southward field. Okay. South. And I can draw the sun. Here's the sun. Deet, 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 deet. Okay. Happy sun. All right. So here's the sun blowing the solar wind. The mouth the southward magnetic field is this way and it continues to slam into this. And you just saw what happens. It ends up opening up this field, okay? Takes this stuff and folds it back. Takes this stuff and folds it back. And I'm not gonna go through the details of that because it's way too much for you. But as it folds it back, these footprints, these foot points that are in the North Pole and the South Pole down here, if I were to look straight down on the North Pole, I'd look down at this. Okay. And as you can see, these foot points are in the day side of Earth, just a little bit, not by much. If I were to try to draw a line with my thing, I'd probably mess it up like 20 times before I got it right. But here you go. This is kind of like cutting the Earth right at the terminator between dawn and dusk, or between day side and night side. Night sides, you can't see it's dark. Okay. But you can see that the foot points are really connected on the day side, so on the sunlit side of Earth. But what happens when these field lines can get folded over? And they get folded over because you have more solar wind. <laughs> you have more solar wind coming. Whoa, hello, wrong color. Let's do that again. More solar wind's coming all the time. I don't know why that one's darker. But more solar wind's coming in all the time. And it ends up, as it breaks it, it, it you know, more solar wind is constantly pushing. Um, pushing, pushing, pushing. The solar, the solar wind blows out this way, right? This is... This is the flow. So as, it, as the solar wind is flowing out, the magnetic field is being driven out. It hits, breaks, and whoa, right? It hits, it hits, it breaks, and it folds. Magnetic field is like, like a paper folding over this thing, OK? So the solar wind is being pushed. And, the, and so these mag, the magnetic flux, more magnetic field lines just stack up and stack up and stack up, OK? So what happens is that as all that stacking up is happening and it's folding this stuff in, there's this drag, we talk about drag, there's this drag on the magnetic field and it drags these field lines right across to the day or to the night side. That's what you're seeing here. You're seeing field lines on either side being dragged to the night side, okay? But as that process continues, more stuff happens, and I'm not gonna go into the details, but there's a lot of reconfiguration that happens. And once the reconfiguration on the sun, on the Earth's night side happens, okay, we, off, we get aurora, we get a geomagnetic storm, lots of good stuff. But it reforms that flux and the flux begins to, ro it rotates, causes it to rotate, moves, moves it to lower latitudes, not so at the pole, but moves it down to lower latitudes, and it moves it back around. Again, I went through all of this stuff in gory detail in the last two courses. <laughs> so just in case you're lost, Trust me, there are resources for you using exactly this. I went, I had a three hour, two sets of three hour courses if you really wanna dig deep down into it, okay? So what happens then is that you set up on both sides of the Earth's sun line, you set up a pattern, a convection pattern. In this case, it's a magnetic field convection pattern, right? That's going like this, okay? over the poles to the, dawn, to the dusk side and back around. When you do that, that sets up, that magnetic field moving sets up electric field. Electric field means currents. You're driving currents. When you drive currents, okay, because anybody who knows magnetic field and electric field, they're one hand, they're, you know, they're left hand and right hand. When you get one and one moves, you get another created. You create another. So as this process, all from the solar wind driving this stuff in constantly, as this process happens, you set up convection patterns. Those convection patterns of the magnetic field drive currents. 
those currents that are now in the upper atmosphere, well, they don't just do their, they're not just there for fault for show. Those currents and those magnet and now them are driving not only other magnetic fields, but what's happening, what's what's witnessing that are all the particles up here that are charged, basically the ionosphere. Because if if anyone has followed the teachings that I've done in the past, particles that are charged have to obey electric and magnetic fields. I've said it so many times, you're probably sick of hearing it. Particles that are charged must obey electric and magnetic fields. The neutral atmosphere doesn't care, right? Doesn't see them, doesn't care, la, 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 la. But the charged particles, which are the ionosphere, they do care. So if you're gonna start moving stuff this way in a convection, and you're creating more convection in, in, with, the, with, the, um, with the electric field, well, you're gonna start creating motion in those particles, right? You're driving motion. Okay, again, that's how currents are created is because now you're driving charged particles and you're making a move, that's a current. The issue is the neutral atmosphere doesn't care, except it does care about mass, right? So maybe it doesn't care about the electric and magnetic fields, but what it does care is if it gets stampeded by other particles that are slamming into it. So you've got the upper ionosphere, the upper atmosphere, moving in a stampede right now it's convecting and it's moving as this big group and the neutrals better get out of the way or start moving with it otherwise they're going to get trampled well that's what happens the neutrals begin to get slammed as if it's billiard ball time and you start moving the whole thing so now you've got a bigger stampede and now the stampede involves both the ionosphere and the neutral atmosphere and this is what we call the flywheel effect and if I, hold on a sec, where's my, here it is. Very important that I have this. A very good friend of mine gave me this for exactly this reason. Isn't this cute? This is a fidget spinner with the sun on it. I don't know if you can see that. See the sun? But it's very useful in demonstrating a flywheel. And it's also dem demonstrating inertia, right? Angular momentum and inertia. So when you spin something like this up, that's what we're doing here. We're spinning this thing up on this side. And the other side is the other way, <laughs> right? But we're spinning this thing up, right? That's fine. And that would, that's what happens with a, with a geomagnetic storm. And it, it also explains why, when you turn a storm off, why it takes a while to calm down. Well, you take the source away. I'm not spinning it anymore, but it's still spinning. It has to spin down on its own. So oftentimes we see magnetic field flip off, storms turn off, and yet aurora is still visible. Why? You gotta run the energy out of the system, okay? But here's the trick. Do you remember that first storm we saw? That storm had northward magnetic field. This is the condition for southward, right? We have the southward magnetic field. That drives convection in this way, where you start on the day side, you move at high latitudes over the poles to the night side, you drop down to low latitudes, and then on dawn in the dawn and dusk sector, you come back. What do you think happens when the field reverses? Think the convection patterns reverse? Uh-huh. So if I go to 127 seconds as opposed to 27 seconds, now we have a totally different convection pattern. Let me see if I can show, are you gonna show it? Let me show where, just so you can see the magnetic field, yeah. Okay. And yeah, let me show here. Let me see if I can stop it. So you see, whoops, let me kill this too. Good. So you can see behind me on this side, see the northward magnetic field now? We're gonna watch it. Now we're talking about the slinky, but now we're not talking about the slinky. Notice we're not talking about the slinky anymore on the day side. We're actually talking about the part of the slinky that's on the night side. Remember that slinky goes all the way around, right? So there is a slinky on the night side too. Well, what happens? Now you get the solar, you know, the day side, the day side slinky is northward field. The day side slinky is sitting right here. It sees a northward field from the sun or from the, from the solar wind and it doesn't care, it just holds it off. It says, nah, I'm not letting you in, nope, not, not feeling it, 
not happening. So that field just kind of has to wrap and fold over just like that sheet of paper we were talking about. It's wrapping just like it would have to do because the sun is still blowing a wind. So that field still has to fold over, but it's no longer connecting and reconnecting here. So what happens? Uh-oh, do you see what I see? Ah, oh, you went too far, you turkey. Let me see if I can stop it better. <laughs> okay, see this field coming in this way, right? I put my flywheel down. So it's a magnetic field pointing this way. Well, I should probably see if I can do it this way. This comes in this way. Whoops, this way. <laughs> this one comes in this way. Uh-oh, do you see the parallel field? I mean, the anti-parallel, right? What do you think happens? Same thing down here, right? Just opposite direction. Boop. And now what happened? You had something that was on the night side, and now it's swinging to the day? Wait, isn't that opposite? Before we had a day side that was swinging to the night. Now it's a night side swinging to the day. Uh-oh. Totally different convection pattern. Sure enough, I'll let it play one more time. It should bring up the convection pattern here. There we go. So there's the convection pattern. What do we see? Over the poles, night side goes to the day side. And then you wrap, it's a little bit more complicated, but you wrap around, if I can show it here, at least in this area, you wrap back around at lower latitudes to the night side. So now you have a flywheel going the opposite direction. So northward magnetic field and southward magnetic field can oftentimes do very different things in different areas. Okay, so up close to the poles, you have a problem. So what happens if you have a flywheel that's spinning up, let's say in this method, in this way, right? It's spinning, it's got lots of energy, right? But you suddenly go, oh, no, 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 slow down, slow down, reverse, 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 right? How much energy does it take to break that flywheel to the stop and reverse its direction? Probably a lot, huh? How about all of the energy that it would take normally going into Aurora? And what do you think happens to that neutral atmosphere when the stampede has been going on for a day in one direction and suddenly, without warning, the cows <laughs> that are the charged particles suddenly reverse direction start going the other way and trying to push this way. And the neutrals are going, no, 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 we're going this direction. What, what's the matter with you? We're, we're all stampeding like this. And the, and the charged particles go, no, 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 I'm feeling, we got to go this way, right? And so now they're smashing into one another, scatter, craziness, heating, right? Maybe a bit more heating. How much heat comes when you slow a, fl a flywheel? How, how warm does your finger get? Try a bicycle tire, <laughs> okay? Slow that down with your hand, right? How hot does your hand get? Now try a bicycle tire the size of Earth, or Earth's atmosphere for that matter. Right? Kind of getting the idea? Think that a geomagnetic storm issue, if you flip from a long time, really big stampede that is well established for an entire day going in one direction, suddenly has to reverse and go the other direction. You're slamming that flywheel down, you're stopping that flywheel. And now you may not be driving the aurora that you'd expect, but you're sure heating up the atmosphere. Sound like a perfect storm? Let's go back to the solar wind for a second. Here's that northward for a day, right? Except for this teeny little thing. Just pretend you don't see that. Because that really, I mean, it's there. Granted, there was a little bit of reversal. But for the most part, it was pretty well northward for a long time. What happens here? <laughs> what happened? What do you think was going on right here? as all of this were reversing. We had a roar for field reporters out in the field going, wow, with this strength of magnetic field going southward at almost 20 nanotesla and the solar wind speed at 550 kilometers a second, we should be sitting somewhere around a G2, maybe a G3, for goodness sake, with 20 nanotesla sustained southward field. And they're like, why is it only a G1? Why is the aurora kind of weird and not dropping down like it should, like we'd expect. Anyone say flywheel? Residual energy? That's what I believe. The energy wasn't going into where we'd expect it to go. 
the energy was going into breaking that bicycle tire, that earth atmosphere sized bicycle tire. This kind of situation doesn't happen all that often, but it does happen. Now, do I think for those who are savvy, do I think that, that this can, situation could happen even if it were reversed? Yeah, I do actually. I think that if you went south first and then had a long period of northward field, you also might have a condition, maybe not as strong, maybe not as intense as this, but you could also have a situation where you're heating, you're getting an excess of heating in the upper atmosphere simply because you're having to stop the neutrals now. As long as that southward field were, had, been, had been sustained for a long period, just like the northward field here had been sustained. Now notice also we weren't done. <laughs> There was yet another event that occurred. We had lots of things from that particular region. So what originally started as just one event that we expected ended up being two events definitely that we didn't expect. By the way, Starlink was launched right about here. Okay. Right when we were breaking that flywheel, possibly at the peak of the heating as we were breaking that flywheel. I mean, breaking like slowing down, not braking, but slowing, put the brakes on, whew, slow it down so we can reverse the convection pattern. And a lot of that ionospheric energy was going in that, that magnetospheric energy was going into there. The solar storm energy was going into slowing that flywheel and reversing its direction. Okay. Is that clear to people? That is why, that is my take on why this was a unique situation. And the KP index didn't reach G2 reached a G1, kind of mild. I mean, this is unremarkable. And if this is what goes into the MSIS model for any type of geomagnetic driving, it's not gonna tell you the truth, not a chance. The ovation model was off the charts. If anyone saw that day, the ovation model was sitting at like 144 gigawatts. And I could go into, into Twitter and show it to you. If you really want me to show you, I can go into Twitter. It's all on Twitter. We've had tons and tons of conversation. But the aurora in real life, everybody was going, was this a head scratcher? Why in the world are we not seeing aurora like we should see? Like ovation even tells us we should see. Ovation was definitely labeled this a G2. Possibly if it were that, if it were stained even longer, possibly a G3. But that's not what the numbers tell us. So this is part of my issue with potentially not having a scientist in the loop and having engineers make the decisions for Starlink in that this is one of those things where it's not intuitive. And if you just look at the numbers, you're not gonna understand what happened, okay? This was a perfect storm for Starlink, sadly. And I don't think Elon or anyone else could have seen it coming. What do you think? God, I feel like trolling. Oh Lord, that's the first thing. Coke machine, thanks so much, okay. She is an excellent instructor. Thank you, Matthew. So what do you, yeah, so if you are interested in things like um, the Comet MedEd modules, they're, they're really fun. Uh, they will teach you a lot. Uh, this is NCAR, UCAR, um, and it's, where, where are my modules? You can easily go to, let me see if I can get to the, how do I get to the home page of the Comet MedEd? You can just, and, it, and they're free. It's what I love about this. It's it's free. Hello. If it loads, it's free. <laughs> okay, you're not helping me. Um, let's go back this way, and let's just go. Oh, come on, home. Let's go to home. Well, that's physics. Oh, okay. That that's close. That's close enough. If you see this, you're close enough. So if you log into the into MetEd. Um, uh, or just do a Google search for Comet MedEd, you will see, met, meaning meteorology education, you will see these modules. And this is the physics of the Aurora module. And if you're, of course, in my SWEN classes, this is part of your assignments. <laughs> I will not let you get by without understanding what the flywheel is and what its capabilities are. Okay. So is there a way we can learn from this to adjust prediction algorithms so that operators can plan better? Yeah, the problem is probably not faster than real time. So the problem is that space weather forecasters and, and space weather uh, uh, academics 
have the capability of doing better space weather predictions, but we can't do them faster than real time because the models are so complicated that if you put in all of the different parameters we need to be able to run them more, much more quantitatively, suddenly they run slower than it takes for the storm to get here and cause the damage it does. So really that's what the, that's what the slow end of, of the, the whole thing is. That's what slows the machinery down, the long pole in the tent, so to speak, is that it's just not, we're just not capable of running the, the models that we really want to run, at least the full physics versions of the models we want to run faster than real time with the parameters we want. Sorry if you hear my daughter, if you hear my daughter screaming, she's obviously having fun after school. Um, Oh yeah, I talked with Lourdes. Chris, that's so sweet of you to say. Uh, I yeah, I talked with Lourdes. Uh, I haven't talked with her the last couple of days, but I, I talk with her all the time, uh, DMing through Twitter. So that's kind of you. Um, I missed that, Lisa. I'm sorry. Fred Hill, will this solar storm affect Earth's power grid? No, nah, no, nah, this one was not not a big deal. And in fact, I mean, I think a KP index is is okay for power grids. So seeing that one. Um, in fact, with a KP of, of five, yeah, I think the power grids really weren't feeling it. What was feeling it was the Earth's upper atmosphere. It was slowing down the neutrals. Remember, the neutrals don't care uh, about what's going on with the electric and magnetic fields. They care about getting slammed. They care about getting stampeded, but they don't care about anything else. Is this the right one? No. Mm -mm -mm. Where is that one? Real time. There we go. Sorry about that. So they didn't care. And, and, Power grids at, at G1, they don't even begin to put in mitigating procedures. This was a this was something that's much more um, a problem for upper atmosphere, for low Earth orbiting satellites. Okay. Um, can I go to can I go to UK sleep now? Yes. <laughs> get some sleep. Yeah, I need the I Spock's daughter cute. I know I need to get sleep. Sadly, in about uh, in about an hour, I have to teach a class. So I'm gonna be up for quite a while yet <laughs> to teach a class at Millersville. Um, yeah, the balloon effect. Okay. Uh, doesn't the storm flow at the speed of the solar wind? No, not all of them. I mean, the speed of the solar wind, sure. But the speed of the solar wind depends upon, you know, if you're talking about the ambient solar wind, like this, for example, has ambient solar wind ahead of it. The solar storm itself was driven faster in this case. And even this storm that hit even later, I don't know if that aligns with it. I think it is. This is this part of the storm. Okay. This was actually what we call a beautiful magnetic cloud, which we didn't see. Notice that the magnetic field, how much stronger it is than this one. We have, from the coronagraph images, you can't tell how strong the magnetic field is. You can't even tell if you have multiple events, if they're all smashed together. Imagine, it's like looking at a shadow and having three people standing kind of partly in a row, and then they all cast a shadow on the ground. And you're now supposed to look at that shadow and figure out, is that one person, two people, 10 people? How many people is on that, right? Hard to tell. Same kind of idea. When we have a chronograph, you take multiple structures and you smash them together in two dimensions. So what does my hand look like? I mean, to us, because we know what hands look like, we know that these are two hands. But if an alien looked at this, for example, they would think, oh, you're a 10 fingered person. Wow, hands are cool on humans, right? They wouldn't have a clue that this was not a single structure. So that's the problem that we have with uh, chronographs being our measurements, not being able to get up and personal with these structures, and we can only look at them far away. In fact, that's part of the reason why heliophysics and space weather itself has the chance of, of doing more than even astronomy and astrophysics can do. It's because we actually do have spacecraft that can get up close and personal, right? Parker Solar Probe, for example, right? Solar Orbiter, for example. We actually, had this, this, the monitors, the solar wind monitors that are sitting just upstream of Earth, they are sampling this. That's what these things are doing. So the pictures that you saw of that stuff coming out from, from the chronographs ends up really looking like this. And we're able to finally see what's in those pictures thanks to sitting in the stuff with these, these in situ, what we call in situ monitors. Only our field in space has that. That's what's unique about heliophysics and why we are such a different set of science than astronomy, astrophysics, and the whole lot that's come before us. Hopefully that answers that question. Steve, quite, quite uh, fantastic video. Thank you. Yeah, putting my putting my name in there really really gets me to look at you. That's for sure. I can see that that at Tam of the Sco very easily. Um, okay, I'm trying to see these breaks in the SDO movies. Are they really eclipses? Yes. Remember, SDO 
SDN, and it only happens, it only happens at certain times of the year. It's the moon. The moon is passing in front of the sun or in, in between the spacecraft and the sun. And the reason for that is because SDO has to sit, has to be parked in geo, in geosynchronous orbit. It can't be parked out where SOHO is. The reason why is because it brings down gigabytes of data a day. SOHO doesn't bring anything down like that. Um, and the only way we can get a pipe, like a straw, think of it being like a, <laughs> you're sucking data through a straw. The bigger straw you have, the more data you can suck faster, right? The only way to get a big straw, you know, big straws are short, <laughs> meaning you have to be close to earth to get a big straw, right? Big straws aren't long enough to reach all the way out to Soho and even thinner straws have to reach to stereo, right? That's why we have to have beacon data, which looks really ratty. Um, so the bigger straw you have, the closer you have to be to earth. That's why SDO, they made that trade and said, we'll park SDO in a geosynchronous orbit, even though it gets eclipsed by the moon every now and again, you know, a few months out of the year, in order to get that big straw, access to that big straw and get lots of data down really fast, okay? Laser comm might eventually revolutionize that, but it's not here yet. Not, not the way we, you know, at least not on NASA missions for this stuff, um, future missions possibly. Matthew says, SDO orbits in low in low e, LOE, low Earth orbit. Oops, it's going on um, the best it can while also trying to keep view of the sun. Yeah, in Texas, right, exactly. It's hard, it's hard. Uh, we, we have limited resources and it's hard for people who just live on this planet to sometimes realize how hamstrung we are, especially when we get good data down. It's hard to, it's hard to realize space is a big place and it's not easy always to get data. Um, caught it live. Good. I'm so glad you were here live for us. Um, what KPI do I have to look at for good propagation and low noise? Oh my goodness. Someone, if you're an amateur radio operator and you want to answer George, please do. That is a, that is an answer. Um, that is an amateur radio operator question and there's lots of resources. Um, let's see what's, and, and what signs will be there for good propagation and lower noise, there, there aren't. Um, that's the trade-off. When you have active regions that can boost solar flux, you have to deal with the, the fact that they're noisy. The reason why they're noisy, that, that noise in itself is what, what the F10.7 flux is. You just don't want it to be too noisy. There's like this, you know, this, this sweet little Goldilocks zone, the sweet spot between being just a little bit noisy, but not too noisy. <laughs> it's that exercise of bring me a rock. No, not that rock, some other rock. No, no, I don't like that rock. Bring me, I'll know the rock when I want it. It's hard to know exactly where that perfect band is of, uh, with these active regions where you want them to be, you know, angry, but you don't want them to be so angry that you can't hear your own communication. It's always a trade-off. Um, so anytime you see the solar flux jump up and that's wonderful for propagation, also expect the bandits to get noisier and expect the chances for radio blackouts because it's the fact that those regions are angry that it's boosting the solar, solar flux in the first place. Um, I, yeah, I'm not going to go into the Birkeland currents. Um, um, what we were talking about, there's a lot of, there, there's quite a few different currents in there. We can go into Hall, Pedersen, Birkeland, Chapman, Ferraro. Oh my goodness. That is a mini course question. And I'm not going to talk about that in this because I, I, I'm really, um, uh, losing my voice as it is. Uh, SDO does a figure eight over North and South America. Well, no, that's the, that's the orbit track on the ground. And it's not, I mean, yeah, okay. So be careful, Matthew, when you say that, be, be careful. Um, okay. What is this? Uh, uh, oh no, you're asking a separate question. Okay. What we need is QCOM. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, guys, um, are there, okay. Someone needs to, if someone can answer George, um, what signs will there be for good propagation and lower noise? Yeah, you put the same question and hopefully I answered that. If, if not, you know, um, I, I don't know what to tell you. In order to get, you, you're not going to go back to being as quiet as it was back in solar minimum. But then, you know, the reason why you're not going to go back there is because solar flux was in the 60s back then. So you're not going to have low noise and, and uh, quiet conditions, but have high f solar flux. It just, it, it's always a trade-off. Um, what is your take on the magnetic cloud theory with these two storm events and would they have had an increased effect on Starlink? Well, that's what this whole talk was about. This is a magnetic cloud right here. If I were to add the component 
the magnetic field component. As a matter of fact, my, my students, we talked about this. Are you gonna let me bring it on? Oh, come on. Let me bring on the magnetic field, the BY component. There it is. This is a beautiful magnetic cloud event. And you know that, my students know that because it is an east, south, west <laughs> magnetic solar slinky. What that means is that the leading field was moving east. East is this direction. I'm going to make my, make my right hand. We'll see if my right hand works. East, yeah, I have to do it this way. So the east direction, so that's the leading field of this structure. The middle here is in the red is southward because it's pointing down. That is my thumb pointing down. And then the east field wraps around the back to the west, and west is this way. Okay, so this is a right-handed cloud with its axis pointing down. And that is a solar slinky <laughs> that looks like this. With <laughs> There's my broom handle. People start laughing at me. <laughs> yes, I'm doing this once again. I am, I am penetrating the, the, the slinky this way. So the axial field goes down. If you can see it, hello, hello. Can you see the, 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 the lid? That's the slinky, okay? So the axial field's pointing down, and the slinky is this way, and it is left-handed, or it is right-handed. I mean, right-handed, sorry. Um, and so when you do your right-hand rule, this is what it is. You get the east being in the leading field, wraps around, that's the, that's the field that goes around, we call the poloidal field, and then the axial field is my thumb that threads through the center of the structure. And you can get that, literally, from looking at this. When you get these beautiful rotations that are very, very smooth, Oops, I can't, I got to point in the right way. Very, very smooth. Okay. Meaning that it starts in this case as a bite. This is a um, uh, bidirectional, bidirectional, bipolar um, um, uh, signature, meaning it starts positive, it smoothly rotates to negative and comes back. And this is a unipolar signature, meaning it starts in one direction, stays in one direction, peaks and then comes back. That is a classic magnetic cloud signature. So for those of you who are interested in what magnetic clouds are, they are essentially the best of the best of the best flux ropes. They are the grade A flux ropes. So that's what this is. This is what we call a mutt. <laughs> this is pedigree. This is mutt. <laughs> this is what we thought we had. This is what was hiding behind the mutt. <laughs> so there was a purebred behind the mutt. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm a dog owner. What do you want from me? Okay. Hopefully that, hopefully that's a good place to end it. <laughs> okay. So yes, yeah, Starlink got, got hit. Starlink got done in by the pedigree, not by the mutt. How's that? But it really was, I think it was more of a conspiracy between the mutt and the pedigree. Yeah. Okay, guys, hopefully that answers all your questions. And I appreciate you sticking around. Um, and so, hey, if that solar storm starts picking up, you know, that's just hit, go out and get some Aurora if you can, if you happen to be in the right latitudes, okay? Until then, I want a test. <laughs> Join my swim classes. I'll give you a test. It'll be a written test, right? Oh, that's so funny. Actually, the Comet MedEd, you can get a, a, a test. There are tests there, so you can test your knowledge. But it doesn't necessarily go in, not nearly to the level of detail that I'm going into, obviously. And there's only limited stuff that you can get in space weather. But um, yeah, hopefully hopefully you can get a lot of stuff. But you know, I, I, I don't know, maybe eventually I'll make tests available. But right now it's all in Millersville. All right, guys, thanks so much. I see everybody, it looks like everybody enjoyed it. So good, the dog's day, yeah. <laughs> all right, talk soon, enjoy your evening. Oh, thank you, Nick, I just see, your, I see you here, you and, and Lisa. And Coke Machine, you're a patron. I didn't know that. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Excellent, guys. You're welcome, Jerry. I'm still watching you guys. Okay. Bye, all. Bye, Chris. Bye, guys. Talk soon.